Welcome to Beyond Disruption, where you'll learn how emerging tech is changing the world of accounting, business, and finance. Our guest experts break down the latest news in everything from blockchain to robotics, artificial intelligence to human intelligence. Tune in to find out how you can stay ahead of the curve. Hello again. Welcome to the Go Beyond Disruption podcast, where we share insights on emerging technology, human intelligence, and digital transformation. We bring you exclusive perspectives from inside the accounting and finance profession that help you stay ahead of the curve, whether or not you're a finance professional. This applies to businesses who have anything to do with numbers anywhere in the world. And talking of where we are in the world, uh, from our London office in the heart of the financial district, I'm Kyle Hannan. And the reason that we're talking to you today is because of love. How much do people love their accountants? Do they love their accountants? And if they do, why? We'll be talking about bridging the perception gap between what you as an accountant or a finance professional think your customers think of you and what they really think of you. And we're doing that with Robert Craven. You can find links and more information in our show notes, which you can view inside your podcast app or by going to our website, gobeyondisruption.com. Let's get started with uh, today's conversation. Hello, Robert. Where are you speaking to us from today? I am speaking from Bath near Bristol in the southwest, about 120 miles from London. All right. Robert Craven is a CEO mentor. He's a consultant who's helped more than 1,000 companies to revolutionize the ways they work. He's author of the book Growing Your Service Firm. And Rob, your work in marketing and growth strategy has been widely published and acted upon by thousands of businesses and agencies from names that people will recognize from Blackberry to Barclays, from Nando's to Airbus. You've been described as one of the UK's best known keynote speakers, probably the best known when it comes to the subject of growing digital agencies. You also talk about customers, finding them, delighting them, keeping more of them and improving the relationships between customers and clients, being better customers and being better service providers. And any accounting company, any finance advisor will be a service company, especially these days. Now, I've been to some of your presentations and they are almost entirely free of guff. Instead of wall-to-wall -wall theoretical rhetoric and non-stop PowerPoint, you offer practical solutions, tangible business growth results, plus you run around a lot and uh, you force your audience to try and keep up as well. So I'm jolly glad that I've been able to force you to sit in one place for at least this interview to talk about how accounting and finance professionals can grow their service businesses in this age of technological transformation. So I told you I've got a lot to say about you, but I'm sure I've left something out. So what else are you working on? And how does it connect with our topic today about why clients might or might not love you? Um, I'm working on a little, uh, I'm working on a conference for, for the next quarter, which is dead exciting. I'm working on creating uh, a growth program specifically for digital agencies, but it's based on a program I used to run for service firms. So that's still just as relevant for your your listeners. I'm also working on a little booklet, I suppose, of questions. So it's like a, a book of probably four or 500 questions, which you can use when you're coaching. So when you're coaching your team or you're coaching a client, you just say to the client, go to page 27. And what's the first question on the top left-hand corner? And the question might be, is your strategy a sensible one? Or it might be, why should people buy from you? Or it might be, what do your staff really think of you? So it's just a, like a, a prompt for uh, for coaching and for consulting and for mentoring. So that's that's kind of on my to-do list at the moment. And that sounds like you've got all sorts of typical days. You might be writing a book, you might be making a presentation, you may be flying <laughs> off to speak at Google. Uh, do you have such a thing as, as a nine to five? And, and what sector and client types do you focus on? What problems do you typically help them work on? Oh, okay. okay. So two questions. So is there a typical day? No, there's not. I'm desperately ratcheting back the number of nights I spend away from home. Uh, I love the work. I absolutely love the work. Uh, I hate the travel. I think I did 18 countries last year, which is way too many. And we now have a, a, a lead scoring sheet, which goes, do I want to go there? Does my wife want to go there? Do I want to stay there afterwards? Is it profitable? What's the real, the real day rate? 
Uh, and then is it help the strategy of the business? Does it help the profit? And unless I score 16 out of 20, I don't go. So, so yes to Singapore, yes to Athens, yes to Amsterdam, yes to New York, uh, no to, and now I've got to be really careful because there might be people listening, no to some other places, yes to, yes to Joburg. So the answer is there's not a typical day. Uh, and who do I work with? Service is what we work with. And, and more, and more recently in the last four or five years, it's almost been exclusively in terms of new clients, digital agencies, but I've got, sort of four or five consultants who work with me and we work with accounting practices, architectural practices, uh, IFAs, just done quite a lot of work with IFAs and, well, they're not IFAs, they are holistic wealth uh, management companies. Uh, so they're, they, they're doing what IFAs do, but they're doing it in a very different way. And, and it's really, it's really the selling of hot air. It's really the, the lack of product. It's the lack of inventory, the selling of reputation. That's, that's, where I really focus on. When you talk about what a service company can do to understand the value it brings, uh, how it has to define itself and then redefine itself as the world around it changes, as the customer environment changes, as customer expectations and the, the technological environment transforms uh, what used to be pretty easy to understand, suddenly everything is changing. And, and as the world around us changes, so so do we. And the way to do that is to understand where we fit. And you talk a lot about this. You've talked about differentiation. You've talked about segmentation. So what is the difference between those two? Why is it important to a, a finance or an accounting professional these days? All right, great question. I mean, this is, in some senses, this is marketing 101. And, and what I'm what I'm known for is... 101 stuff. I don't do complicated. I'm, I'm not bright enough to do complicated. But more importantly, I think the it's the fundamentals. If we don't get them right, then everything else doesn't work. So the kind of def- differentiation segmentation stuff started way back in 1961 with a uh, Theodore Levitt wrote a, an article for Harvard Business Review called Marketing Myopia, which I actually carry around in my bag with me because everyone's so funky and so look at how many viewers and likes I've got and so on and so forth. And they've kind of forgotten the basics, which um, Levitt talks about. So customer differentiation, customer segmentation and differentiation. Segmenting is chopping up your audience into groups of like-minded people with similar problems who will buy in a similar manner. So it's not the top 10%, but it might be, it's more likely to be the top 11% or 12%, but it might be people with businesses between one and five million turnover, or it might be people with more than a hundred staff, or it might be people in the petrochemical industry. And then you can, you can fine tune that. So it might be, uh, finance directors of, uh, blue chip companies in the UK. So you're, 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 so you're segmenting, you're cutting down, stripping away. So you're looking at a specific segment, a specific group of people who behave in a similar manner. That's the important thing. Their behavior is actually more in their psychographic is actually more important than their their category. And then differentiation. I mean the answer to differentiation is why should is why are you different? So why should people bother to buy from you when they could buy from the competition? That's that's the fundamental differentiation question. Because if you're the same as a competition, I can't think of a single reason why you should why I should buy from you. So now we've got the segment, we've got um, um, people like Jerry, as an example, and Jerry is my sort of uh, avatar of my segment. Jerry is a 45-year-old finance director, two kids, uh, wife's at home, BMW 4x4, uh, go skiing, uh, it's got real issues about delivering value to the board, it's got a finance controller, uh, really concerned about giving information that makes sense. So now we've got to we figure out who he is and he plays golf and blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, the differentiation is what makes us different from the rest of the companies he might come across. So we might be local, we might be faster, smarter, brighter, ruder. We might only have PhDs. We might be online, we might be offline. Uh, we might deliver a, a, a value for money offering. We might, uh, we might be charging on um, value added. Uh, we might uh, always spend half a day a week in the client's premises. We might do everything online. It's, it's, about, it's about, yeah, h- how are we different from other people? And it's not about gimmicks. It's about how do we do stuff 
differently from other people so that people will remember. And so differentiation and segmentation, pull them together, and then you've, you've hit the sweet spot. But surely that doesn't affect the world of those big organizations, those big brands you've spoken to. I mean, if you talk about companies like uh, Research in Motion, um, the RIM, the, those are the people behind BlackBerry, uh, Barclays, those big organizations, surely there's no way that people don't get the value that they might offer. I mean, there's so much that they can do for people. Do you still get a sense that there there is a frustration that clients sometimes don't get the value that the professionals or the organizations can bring them? Well, I think I think there's two sides to that. So I think firstly, uh, there is always a differentiation. Like you have Apple people and Android people, you have Mercedes people and you have Audi people, you have and so on and so forth. So firstly, from the customer's point of view, we have tremendous loyalty just to specific brands that we feel when we use this stuff, it fits who we think we are and how we want to project to the outside world. So there is a real thing about uh, people like us buy from people like us. So so just leaving aside for a moment how that's a, a manipulation of the marketing world, I think there is a sense of of, of who we are and who we're not, whether it's our, our coffee brand, the clothes we wear, whether we have big labels or not. Uh, the larger organisations do end up offering blander products. And you just got to think about it, you know, from, from I mean, if I'm, if I'm looking for an accounting firm or a finance firm, the problem that I have, firstly, you, you don't know me from Adam, you don't know whether I'm young, old, high profit, low profit in a dying industry, in a growing industry, whether my real, in, my real preoccupation is keeping my wife happy or whether my real preoccupation is keeping my, my MD happy or my shareholders happy. So it's very difficult for you to have a conversation with me until we know that. But uh, the problem is, you know, from my point of view, you employ similar people at similar wages using similar software and similar hardware to deliver similar products and similar services sold to me on similar looking websites and similar proposals by similar business development people. And it is all so bland. It's all so beige. It's all so boring. You all look the same to me. Your websites always have people pulling ropes, climbing trees, glowing up rocks. We work together. Your website always says what makes us different from the rest is our obsession with customer service. And you have some bland, you know, stupid Fred from Essex says, this financial company was the best thing I ever... It is just so bland and dull. Seth Godin talks about this notion of, of the purple cow, something that actually stands out. And for me, I will look for someone who stands out, someone who is different from the rest. I, I don't want to be working with people who are absolutely the same as the rest. And I think most people are saying, I am not a number. They're saying to the banks, you know, treat me like an individual. Do not, you know, do not send me an email to, to one of 10,000. Do not send letters saying, you know, dear Mr. R.S. Craven. You know, I don't mind paying to be treated as an individual. So the segmentation becomes really important. And so the differentiation straight behind that. But then when you've got that perception gap between what the companies or the, the, the finance advisors or the accounting firm, all as service companies trying to promote themselves as a service company, as a business partner to new clients or reinforce the work they're already doing with existing clients. How do they get a sense of what that perception gap is? Because, you know, this is not something that's, that's new. This has been around forever. So if we dip into how we identify and bridge that perception gap again in a few minutes, but let's talk about the problems that you saw affecting the profession, let's say, 10 years ago. What, what was the last big disruption that you saw changing the, the ground that they thought until that moment had been perfectly steady to walk on? OK, I, I, I think the question's a bit of a red herring. And everyone's going to go, but you don't know what it feels like to be facing bots and AI. You don't know what it's like to be facing companies in India. You don't know. But but let's just, I mean, I'm just going to go back to Theodore Levitt, 1961. Okay, so Levitt says that we have marketing myopia. We we think that, that we've got to look and sell our product or service to the customer like a factory, you know, and, and IFAs. And I have to say the accounting profession uh, have been incredibly guilty of having 
uh, a product or a service set, a bit like a factory, and they go out and they sell this product and service set looking for people who want to buy their product or service set. Now, now what Levitt talks about is, is, is absolutely spot on, that everyone is obsessed with the tactics, the latest AI, the latest online, the latest white paper. They're all obsessed with this detail of the tactics. But but the real issue is not about the tactics. So you go, oh, it's not about tactics. I know what it's about. It's about strategy. So everyone gets on their high horse about strategy. All the big blue chip accounting firms go off and do their strategy weeks and strategy forums to figure out what their strategy is going to be to deal with the competition and the changes in the environment. And as Levitt quite rightly points out, it's not about strategy. It's about, you know, it's about the customer. It's about, about what's going Going on for the customer and how can we satisfy the customer the thing about our changing environment that's 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 kind of our problem and and what we don't focus enough on we focus too much on the competition what the competition are doing we don't focus enough on what it feels like to be a customer and what is it that will actually solve the cop the customer's problems and hurts and until you go all the way back to creating a value proposition which understands what well, not the benefits, but the underlying benefits are for the for the customer. You're not going to get anywhere, and and too many accounting financial firms think that their solution is what the customer wants. I don't want an accountant so that I can know that my tax is correct. All accountants are going to give me roughly the same tax bill. I'm buying from an accountant because they give me peace of mind, and then as long as accountants think that they're selling. Oh, uh, we're more efficient at doing your tax bill. We're more efficient at doing your payroll. We're more efficient at giving you VAT advice for how you work across 17 different countries. As long as they think that that's what I'm buying, they're, they're doomed. People don't buy what you do, even though you've been trained for seven years and you've got to pay. People don't buy what you do. They buy what you do does for them. So for me, my, my accountant gives me peace of mind. My accountant also helps me grow my business tremendously quickly. Um, and as long as an accounting firm thinks that they're selling compliance or thinks they're selling business advice, you know, they're, they're, they're in some senses barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm almost a bit nervous bringing up my next question then because I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to shoot this one out to the water too because you've said that there are certain constants which go right back to the 60s and, and that still affect business today. So I'm getting a sense you might tell me I'm wrong. Surely one of the other constants is that there are always going to be two sides to the equation, two sides to the table on the one side is the customer and on the other there are service providers. Now, surely that's still the case or is technology becoming a third part of the equation? Well, technology is a means to an end. And and I I can see that you're you're plotting a little picture which has got the customer on one side, the service provider on the other side. And now you're you're adding technology, uh, and, and if you're going to add technology to the bottom of that triangle, I'm going to add add one to the top. Yeah, I was afraid you'd do that. Uh, so now we've got four dots, which is customer experience, because I think that's the bit that matters. Look, we did a survey six, seven years ago, 360 firms, all professional service firms. So there are accountants, some architects, some surveyors, but primarily accountants and lawyers. And we said to those 362 firms, do you believe that you give a superior customer experience? OK, so, so in other words, do you think you're doing your job? And the number, I'm just looking up here, was 80%. 80% of the firms we spoke to said, yes, of course we deliver a superior customer proposition. We then went to the customers of those self-same companies and said, do you agree that your professional service provider, do you agree that they give you a superior customer experience? And 8% said yes. OK, so that's a delivery gap. I mean, you can do the maths between 8 and 80 of 72%. Now, the only reason we did this is because McKinsey had done something like this. And likewise, um, I think it was Accenture had done something similar. And we thought it was rot. OK, we didn't agree with it. And we were all identical. That basically, we believe we're doing something really awesome. They don't. That is the customer experience gap. When you actually look at what people say is really important, okay, uh, 
the service providers say, you know, this is this is a survey on on B two B sales for professional service firms again. When you ask the service providers what they think is really important to the customer, they say. We're a driver of innovation. We're role models for corporate social responsibility. We shape the direction of the market. We have global reach. We promote diversity, equal opportunity. From the customer's point of view, they couldn't give up monkeys. They're, they What they want is open, honest dialogue about customer society. They want that you act responsibly across the supply chain, that you've got a high level of specialist experience. So that's McKinsey on 1,400 executives. And then you say to them, OK, so what's the top most important thing? And the only thing that the service provider says is the number one most important thing for us is that we have a high level of specialist expertise. That's why people will buy from us. And then when you go to the customers and you say, why will people buy from you? They say, we want open dialogue. It's like a, a mismatch. And the mismatch just goes on and on and on. You know what we and that's the frustration I have. And that's the perception gap we're talking about. So what does this mean in practice? Let's say a company has a sense that something needs to change. So give us some examples of the ways that you've seen financial or accounting organisations get to grips with some of the changes that this realisation of, of a growing perception gap uh, might force them to make. They say, right, let's, let's turn things around. Where do they start? Okay, so, so it's not that hard. So, so firstly, don't get me wrong, I think professional service firms are fantastic. I think they have really difficult challenges because we have no inventory and because we're selling time and we're selling hot air and we're selling reputation. And my gripe, if I have one, which I do, is that they could be adding so much more value to their clients, they could be doing even better for their clients and therefore they could be separating themselves from the competition even more. I just feel that they're kind of shortchanging their clients and themselves because they can't see the wood for the trees. So all you need to do is say, okay, why do clients defect? And then say, okay, so in that case, can we get to an understanding of why they why they select? So we know why they defect. There's loads of research on that. Again, you know, 1% of customers die, 3% move away, 5% has a friend, 9%, only 9% go to the competition, 19% are dissatisfied with the service, 68% believe you don't care about them. In other words, a senior partner came in, sold the work to you, and then they bogged off, leaving you with flossy in accounts to look after you. That's McKinsey, and then you've got Aquila and Kotlin, uh, saying just the same thing. Two thirds of customers leave because you just don't treat me right. I mean, the, the writing's on the wall. And then if you flip round and say, okay, so why do customers select? So this is the bit we need to listen to. Right at the top of that, there's about five things, five, six things. Number one, interpersonal skills, emotional intelligence. So we're just talking about engagement. Someone who I look you in the, I get the whites of the eyes, I go, I think I trust you to work with me on something so important. The research says this word aggressiveness, it doesn't mean aggressive as in I'm going to punch you in the face. It means an enthusiasm and an excitement to work with me. Okay. I interviewed a possible consultant to work here and he failed straight away because he was just like dead. I mean, he had great qualifications, but zero interpersonal skills, no great enthusiasm, didn't get the sense he could be really bothered to work with me. Boom, he's out. Same thing applies. An interest in the customer and, and an ability to explain what the heck they're doing. You're an expert, so you need to be able to uh, not bamboozle me with science, but keep me in the loop and, and demonstrate that you're clever, obviously, but not too much of that. A willingness to give advice, perceived honesty. These are the things. And I think, you know, we need to start giving value from the moment we meet the client, not I'll give you value when you signed up to us. We just need to get on and have relationships and start helping clients by giving them the support and assistance they need before they even pay. You know, I mean, why, why would you not do that? Not just the we'll do a free systems audit, but actually give generously of your time and create that longer term relationship make it not transactional but make it a relationship work on that but also as you said it helps to not ask yourself will my customer leave me will my client leave me but just assume that at some stage they will and your job is to figure out why when the inevitable happens uh, why why it will happen um, and we'll be talking a little bit about 
the three kinds of customers, uh, strangers, friends and lovers. When we continue our conversation shortly, we'll be discussing some practical tips to understand how a financial team or an accounting practice can really see themselves as a service company and then to make sure that their customers see them the same way. That is coming up. Uh, Let me just remind our listeners in uh, more than 145 countries around the world at the moment, I know Rob's um, already mentioned some of them, that they are listening to the Go Beyond Disruption podcast. It's brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. You can find out more about this podcast and about the rest of our wider projects uh, by going to gobeyonddisruption.com. That's where you'll find uh, all the rest of our podcasts and uh, plenty more besides. So let's look away from the web and uh, focus back on a conversation with Robert Craven. Rob, we talked about differentiation and segmentation from the service provider side of things, but you've explained this also works on the other side of the equation too as well. So how would it help today's companies to understand that there are different types of customer as well? Because you you talked about there being three different types of customers. I guess, yeah. So there's potential customers really more than customers or people out there. So let's just start at the beginning. Sort of uh, most professional service firms, they get 75 to 80% of their business from referrals, word of mouth, and then maybe 20%, 15%, 10% of their business from outbound marketing activity. They focus all their time on marketing activity. And I'm, going to get, I'm just going to go, duh. So in my world, there are three, there are three sorts of, of people out there. There are strangers. They don't know who I am. They don't know what I do. They don't know who my clients are. They don't know what my reputation is. Uh, and I'm going to have to work really, really hard to persuade them to talk to me, never mind pick up the phone, never mind give me any money. Then I have what I call friends. So friends have heard about me. Uh, They may know people who've worked with me. We may have met, we may have talked, uh, we may have sort of done some dancing around each other, but they're not, they're not, they're not clients. And then my third box in my very simple word is lovers who adore what we do. They love what we do. They are ambassadors for what we do they they relish the service they recognize the value they're getting and uh they really want to help us so i have a very simple map of the world now most businesses invest 80 percent of their time uh trying to talk to strangers who don't know who you are don't know what you do don't know what your reputation is Uh they spend maybe 15 percent of their time and money trying to talk to friends who do know who you are uh, and and are kind of a bit interested. And maybe if you're lucky, 5% of their time and money talking to the lovers. And I think that's totally the wrong way around. I think I think people buy f- by relationships. Um, they buy engagement. So I think you can almost flip that triangle through 180%, 180 degrees. So what you what you would end up with is spending 80% of your time talking to the lovers, 15% of the time talking to the friends and 5% talking to the strangers. Now, marketing departments are, are based entirely around getting the word and getting the brand out there and getting and you know running running conferences and running events and kind of creating leads and a, and a, and a lead flow. And so I, I, I totally get that. But I just think we're leaving money on the table with our existing customers. I think we should be doing private dinners for them. I think we should be doing white papers for them. I think we should be uh, running events for them. I think we should be taking out for coffee. I think we should have referral programs in place where we're specifically asking them for referrals. I think we should, uh, ask them how we can help them and how, and how they can help us. I think it's working with the lovers. That's how you grow the business because as already agreed, only 15, 20% of your customers come from non word of mouth stuff. So why on earth work even harder? That's, that's what I don't get. It's like uh, outbound marketing doesn't work. So we'll put more money into it to make it work. But you haven't actually finished exploring how you can get business out of your lovers. So you just don't spend enough time with with, 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 with the lovers because they, they people, I'm going to say it again, people, uh, when people buy us, they buy us because we're people like us, that people like us buying from other people like us. So it's about it's about making those connections and making the engagement 
talking, sharing, helping, being generous, interpersonal skills, emotional intelligence. Well, I'm going to pick up on something you did when you flipped that uh, old way of doing things uh, on its head and you know said, don't spend 80% of your budget on, on strangers, spend it on your, your lovers, the people that are closest to you. I'm, I'm going to flip the mm. old Simon and Garfunkel song on its head. Um, people will know the song 50 mm. Ways to Leave Your Lover, uh, based on what you're telling yeah. us, the 50 ways for your lovers <laughs> to leave you. Um, so, so when it comes to understanding why these customers will leave, unless you can make them see your value more clearly, what are some best practices that you can give us an insight on, some best practices in the sector, and also remind us about things we should not overlook if we're trying to put ourselves out there, our, our accounting or finance firm as a service company, make sure we express and communicate our value more clearly to bridge that perception gap? Yeah, okay. So what is customer experience? I mean, customer experience is the delivery, the operations, the delivery of the promise, the marketing. So what's really interesting is when I sign up with your firm, the actual thing I think I'm buying is probably quite different from the thing that you sold. And so the first thing is you've got to figure out a way of knowing what it is that you think I'm buying. Does that make sense? So that, that's the first thing. So we've got to really be clear about what we've contracted to deliver. Then I think we need to, once you've done that, then we need to over deliver and we need to find a business model that suits our way of working for our customer segments, for the way in which we're different, that we can measure stuff. So uh, I'm, I'm a great fan of Net Promoter Score, which is incredibly simple at the end of the day. It's just on a scale of one to 10. Uh, would you recommend us to a friend or a colleague? Um, and that one number, you know, will tell you exactly whether you're delivering or not delivering. But I think on top of that, I think you need to understand how the client wishes to work with you. Do they want monthly, weekly, quarterly meetings? Do they want graphs? Do they want 500 page reports and so on and so forth? Do they want to meet at your premises, not at your premises and so on? So all that needs to be sorted out. I think you need to understand what it is that people are buying. So I keep going back to that. So in our consultancy practice, in the work of whatever we do, and this applies, you could apply this in an accounting firm, you know, we help you, you know, grow your business so that you can have the life you really want to lead. So therefore, you know, question number one, Mr. or Mrs. Client is what is the life you want to lead? Because if I understand what that is, then I can help you run the agency business service firm that you are running at the moment. And I think it's a similar thing going on. We need to understand really clearly what the, the client's job is, what they, what makes that job better, what makes that job worse. We need to design our product around that. And we need to keep talking. We just need to keep talking just in a, in a way that people find that they want, you know, and if, they, if it's online, if it's Skype, if it's face to face, we need to keep talking. And, uh, just because we can email stuff doesn't mean that's the right way of communication. So there's there's an interesting balance here. So we think we're the most important thing to our clients. In fact, maybe five times a year, we're the most important thing to our clients when they're buying new premises or it's the end of the tax year or they're thinking of exiting. But they don't spend the whole time worrying about their accountants or their, their the financial service provider. So we just need to figure out what it is that they want. You know, spend a day in their shoes. Just ask them what they want. Customer is king, as they say. And I'll take you back to something you mentioned earlier. You said there's too much of a focus on tactics first and strategy. Can we get too caught up on this value add thing? I mean, we talk about do people get the value that we can bring them as financial or accounting professionals? But as you said, perhaps there are other things we should focus on as well. Is the value all there is to it? Well, great question. I run a small business. We have an accounting firm. I will openly admit that I adore and love my accounting firm. I think they're absolutely brilliant. But I don't know whether they're better or worse than another one. ABC accounting firm up the road might be able to save me more money or, or make me more efficient or make me more effective, but I only, only have one accountant at the time. So what's really important is how they make me feel. 
And if they make me feel that they're doing a great job and then they make me feel that I'm getting a really great service, then I believe that I am and I won't move and I will be loyal. And more importantly, I will tell everyone I meet who they are and that they should phone them and speak to them. I stand up in front of a thousand people, wave my arms around and say, I love my accountant. And people come up to me and say, who is this marvellous accountant? I say, I'll tell you who they are. So this is just kind of confirmed the strangest friends and lovers things. I'm, by delivering awesome service, I am spreading the word as an ambassador. I'm a lover helping them grow their business. And I'm help, happy to help them grow their business because if they grow their business, they'll have more money. They'll be more up to date. They'll give me better information and I'll get a better service because I'm a premier client, blah, blah, blah. Imagine a finance professional using love to sell what they do. I mean, it's not always been the most emotional of professions. It's fascinating. It's uh, a bit surprising, but you can't deny it that unless you've got people buying into what you're doing for them, you're not going to have a practice, are you? Well, maybe you don't use the word love. Maybe you use the words raving fans. Uh, there's, a, there's a Blanchard book on that. Maybe you use the phrase raving fans, which might or or ambassadors. Okay, but I, but 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 let's not let's not drop this emotional thing because for one, you know, the reasons that people go into the accounting profession is normally because they've got fairly pointy heads and they're really interested in the numbers and the systems and the processes, which is fantastic, which is great. Often they're not as good as the interpersonal stuff. Everything. Everything supports that. But there's a, a, a really disarming thing you can do with clients, which is you say to, the, you say to clients, so, so Mr. and Mrs. Client, potential clients, you say, how do you feel right now about the service you're getting from your current provider? And they say, we feel really frustrated. And you make sure they use the word feel. Uh, you keep going back until they do use the word. We, we feel frustrated. We feel we're not getting the information fast enough. We feel it's not accurate enough. How would you like to feel? And they'll say something like, we'd like to feel that we're up to speed, up to date, and we're using relevant information. And you just let that moment ride for a couple of seconds as the ether goes up and down between the two of you. Look them in the eye, smile and say, we can do that. And, and, and the really interesting thing is that everyone is so preoccupied with selling value for money, selling all our wonderful services, selling all the wonderful features of of our systems and processes that we forget that much of the the purchasing decision is emotional and much of client staying with you can be emotional it's not purely transactional and when it becomes transactional i think you know when i just see you as a transaction machine and i'm just a piece of meat that you're processing you know, I, I'm going to end up buying on price. I'm just going to end up saying, oh, that's interesting. So these guys do do my payroll for £40,000 a year. And it's just, you know, my PA just bangs stuff back and forward to them. And it's costing us that. I wonder if we can get it 10% cheaper somewhere else. Interesting. So let's say we, we bridge this perception gap. We understand how to make sure that our customers see us the way that we hope that they do. How do finance professionals prepare for what's coming up next? Well, the, the CEO, Joe Grigore of Dell, says the next competitive battleground for business is the customer experience. And I actually think he's wrong because I think the competitive battleground is customer experience. How you make me feel, how you treat me, will determine whether I lean into you or not. And then there's there's obviously subplots behind that, which is about, you know, do you understand me? Are you honest? Are you really interested in me? Am I perceiving you as being honest? But I think all the smoke and mirrors are being taken to fancy restaurants or fancy events and offices with gold and silver and chintz and stuff. They might impress some people, but I think more and more, People just want that honesty and a sense that they're working with the good guys. They're working with the right guys or gals, obviously. I think I remember you saying this at one of your presentations. You remind people that you know, everything is changing, but actually nothing has changed. And I think that makes perfect sense. So point us somewhere. If anyone would like to find out more about this topic in general, about you or your work in particular, what are some resources you'd recommend? Ooh, woo, 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 woo. great question. Uh, so I wrote a book a number of years ago called Customer is King. And it, interestingly enough, I it's, it's at least 10 years old and Virgin came back to me and said, could we update the book? And we did update the book, but actually 
we didn't have to update hardly any of it because the only thing we had to update was the thing about about websites and pieces but otherwise just that sense of seeing things through the customer's eyes really hasn't changed we now have evidence that there is a direct cause and effect not just a correlation between customer experience and profitability of businesses so there's some really interesting research around 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 that which i think people should should follow up on and i'll send that link to you Kyle, so you can put those into the show notes. The Grow Your Service Firm book by myself is a great starting point because it really just unpicks what a service firm does and therefore how you can you can engage with clients in an even better way. And I think that accounting and finance professionals are vulnerable, partly because they've got legal and legislation on one side uh, and they are professional by definition but but professionals have lost their way uh in the old days professional was about putting the clients at needs and wishes first uh, banking crises and so on and so forth meant that professionals put their own needs and requirements first and then the client came after us so i think it's, in some senses i'm saying let's get back to an old old school way but yeah the grow your service firm book is is a is a great place to go to uh and the other book which i think people will find quite entertaining is bright marketing which is just thinking through how we present ourselves and how we how we make things happen all right and now to wrap up one thing we do at the end of every episode of the go beyond disruption podcast is try to find something for accounting and finance professionals to take away something that will help them go beyond disruption so what you can do robert craven is help us finish the sentence the reason i love my accountant is dot 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 how do we finish that? Okay, the reason I love my accountant is really, really simple. And the reason I love my accountant is because he enables me to run a better business. He enables me to have a better life. And I can't stop there because it is as simple as that, that his practice has become part of my business. They've got under the skin of my business by knowing lots about me because they charge fixed fee rather than hourly rates. It encourages them to be efficient, encourages me, encourages me to be demanding uh, because they have a process which says they will meet with me quarterly and they will attend my quarterly board meetings. I have to work around that because they segment and only work with high performing independent professional service firms they have that niche that they're able to deliver really really well and they really understand what's going on in the niche so they kind of do kind of everything i talk about you know differentiation segmentation processes and systems understanding the customer thinking not of the service they're offering but of of why the customer wants that service so yeah that's my, my that's my statement i think Lots to love. Thank you, Robert Craven. A great place to end our conversation today. We'll make sure we, we include the resources Robert's mentioned in our show notes. And you can visit gobeyonddisruption.com for more. Two other websites we'd recommend for listeners interested in taking this further. If you're already uh, a member of either the AICPA or the CGMA, then you can go to the AICPA store.com slash gobeyonddisruption or CGMA store.com slash gobeyonddisruption. Wherever you are in the world, uh, you'll be able to go to either of those sites to find courses, webinars, and other professional development resources updated every day to keep you ahead of the curve. Thank you again to our guest, Robert Craven, and to you for listening from wherever you are in the world. From our office in the heart of the City of London, I'm Kyle Hannan. We'll be back soon with more conversations that help you and your profession to go beyond disruption. Till next time, goodbye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond Disruption, brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Learn more about today's topic at AICPA-CIMA.com forward slash disruption. This podcast is designed to provide illustrative information with respect to the subject matter covered and does not represent an official opinion or position of the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates. It is provided with the understanding that the association, its affiliates, and subsidiaries are not engaged in rendering legal, accounting, or other professional services. If such advice or expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional person should be sought. 
The association, its subsidiaries and affiliates make no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to and assume no responsibility for the content or application of the material contained herein and expressly disclaim all liability for such damages arising out of the use of, reference to, or reliance on such material.